Thank you, Oliver, for this introduction. And thank you to the organizers for giving me a chance to be a part of this event. Um, it's really, I'm, I'm really nervous, but I'm really happy. So, <laughs> um, all right. So my presentation today will focus on the way citizenship was presented as a goal for education prior to the Indian Citizenship Act by, on one side, white reformers of the federal Indian school system and on the other side by indigenous intellectuals and especially um, activists gathered uh, in the Society of American Indians. Uh, my initial question was to see if institutional education for citizenship, that is considering education as training for citizenship, was seen by different sides uh, as a tool for further encroachment or a tool for possible emancipation. Um, and throughout this presentation, I intend to address several related questions. Was citizenship also a goal for mainstream education, um, as well as Indian education? If yes, what did citizenship mean for the different sides? Um, what did the Society of American Indians have to say about citizenship and the role of education? And finally, I'll conclude with an brief, a brief overview of what happened after the passage of the Act. So the first uh, Indian schools that were created in the colonies that would later form the United States were mostly uh, built by religious institutions. And at the time, and even after independence, these schools had different goals compared to other schools primarily targeting the settler population. Um, the latter were molded out of what existed in Europe and influenced by the philosophies coming from there, notably humanism and liberalism. Craig Kallendorf, in his analysis of humanist education, explains that its goal was to shape the pupil's personality and prepare um, himself or herself to become an exemplary citizen. Um, after independence, schools were seen as a way to spread republican ideals and entrench U.S. sovereignty as a nation among nations. The building of schools accompanied settlers um, every step of the way on their westward invasion uh, of the land. For instance, in 1862, in the newly organized Dakota Territory, Governor William A. Jane declared, I quote, There is no subject more vital to the prosperity and general welfare of the territory than the subject of education. The virtue, intelligence, and public happiness of people, the wealth and power of a country, is immediately associated with and dependent upon the development of the educational interests of the state. So throughout the 19th century, it seemed as though the goals that motivated the creation of schools in the first place, that is spreading democratic ideals and training future responsible citizens, did not really change as state public school systems took form. Still in 1918, um, the Commission for the Reorganization of Secondary Education defined citizenship training and the development of an ethical and moral character whatever that means, um, as cardinal principles for the education of um, American youth. And at the time, this was done through um, different means, but also through programs that focused on teaching pupils uh, about heroic figures such as industrious pilgrims, pioneers and founding fathers to serve as examples for the future leaders of the nation. Um, and chapters praising their individual accomplishments abound in the textbooks that circulated throughout the 19th century and beyond. Um, schools were meant to retell and transmit the, um, to future generations the culture and structure that had developed with the creation of the settler state in order to secure their continued existence. So as I mentioned earlier, the reasons that motivated the creation of Indian schools, that is schools built by missionaries and later the federal government for the education of indigenous peoples, uh, were different. Indeed, the missionaries that endeavored to educate indigenous youth in the colonies and for most of the 19th century were motivated by the conviction that indigenous people and their cultures and ways were inferior and needed um, to be led towards salvation and quote unquote civilization through a process of assimilation. Originally, citizenship was not listed as a goal for Indian um, education, and it was not even a clear goal for federal Indian policy at all. 
In the annual reports of the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, it seems as though calls for citizenship followed the advance of colonization, which makes sense. Um, so colonization on the ground. So different timelines and debates existed depending on the region. But in general, Indian citizenship gradually became a reality after the Civil War, uh, when most of the continent um, had been explored, annexed or invaded. The federal government then established its policy of conquest by kindness, that's the peace policy, um, as it could not afford to wage costly wars anymore, putting the transformation, usually by force, of indigenous people into white-like members of society at the center of its efforts. So, for instance, the governor of Dakota Territory wrote in 1867 that he hoped that, I quote, the condition of the red man may be rapidly improved by means of civilization, education, and Christian influence until he is brought up to the full stature of a man and an American citizen, enjoying not only rest from further encroachment and persecution, but perfect equality with all others before the law. So we can clearly see here how education was apprehended as being necessary to the success of citizenship. In turn, citizenship was presented as an alternative to oppression um, and land theft, since it would, in his mind, inevitably grant indigenous people the same rights as any other citizen, among which would be the protection of private property. Of course, this logic did not take into account the concept of communal use of the land as a form of legitimate right, uh, and depriving indigenous people of that would, in a way, deprive them of parts of their sovereignty. But what the reformers of Indian policies sought to achieve through this quest for uniformity was actually the erasure of indigenous claims to the land, of their ways, of their existence as indigenous people. In 1875, uh, J.G. Hamilton, Indian agent at Sisseton Agency, wrote, I quote, the necessary outcome of the policy of the Board of Indian Commissioners is that the Indian develops gradually into a citizen of the United States. Essential to this is an abandonment of tribal relations and dealing with them as persons, not tribes or bands, or in other words, individualizing them. You must educate to accomplish this, for how else can you awaken the sentiment and develop the elements of nationality? So here, and in countless other um, reports by Indian agents, education meant detribalization uh, and individualization, and it was the preferred tool for such an endeavor. By the end of the 19th century, citizenship became a clear goal for the education of indigenous pupils nationwide, matching in that sense the goals of public schools, conformity and the training of a patriotic and ordinate citizenry. But of course, for indigenous pupils, that also meant uh, having to abandon their own distinctive cultures and ways, because citizenship was believed to be incompatible with tribal affiliation or even indigeneity. As Commissioner of Indian Affairs Thomas J. Morgan stated in 1892, I quote, citizenship accompanied by allotment of lands necessarily looks towards the entire destruction of the tribal relation. The Indians are to be individualized and dealt with one by one and not en masse. Hence, schools were organized around this idea of detribalization. Um, on and then off reservation boarding schools were built to try and isolate children from their communities. They were now allowed to speak their own languages, practice their religion, wear their own clothes. We, we all know here the severe treatment uh, that children had to endure in those institutions. Um, that reshaping was total, and it can also be seen through the ideas that were taught in those schools. Um, in 1891, 30 years before the actual granting of citizenship to all, Thomas J. Morgan reported that, I quote, special attention is paid in the government schools to the inculcation of patriotism. The Indian pupils are taught that they are Americans, the government is their friend, that the flag is their flag, but the one great duty resting on them is loyalty to the government, and that the foundation is led for perpetual peace between the Indian tribes in this country and the white people. So not only did Indian schools uh, endeavor to teach students how to be good patriotic citizens, even before they were actual citizens, uh, but they also taught that American citizenship was superior. Um, in a 1884 report from Carlisle Industrial School, the superintendent, uh, Pratt, uh, 
uh, stated that, um, I quote, it seems plain to me that every educational effort of the government should urge these people into association and competition with the other people of the country and teach them that it is more honorable to be an American citizen than to remain a Comanche or a Sioux. So here lied again the idea of superiority that had motivated uh, the establishment of Indian schools in the first place. Besides, it also matched the general view that was promoted in public schools across the nation that was meant to instill pride and patriotism in the minds of young Americans and longing for citizenship in the hearts of immigrants. This, this idea that, you know, being American is the greatest thing that you can be in the world, sort of. <laughs> So citizenship in the minds of reformers was seen as a final step that would represent the complete absorption of the indigenous other uh, into U.S. society. And education was seen as a way to reach that goal. After that, the quote unquote Indian problem would not exist anymore, according to those people, because indigenous people would have become American citizens. Uh, in that sense, U.S. citizenship did not seem to be compatible with indigenous existence and sovereignty. In the minds of white reformers, citizenship necessarily meant a form of recognition of U.S. legitimacy and U.S. sovereignty, and thus the relinquishing of tribal affiliations and indigeneity. They could not coexist. Nope. Still have the stuff here. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, indigenous intellectuals were split and, and activists were split on the question of citizenship. Some believed that it was uh, better than the wardship system that existed. Others uh, saw it as a new form of control. Um, my focus here is on the writings of members of the Society of American Indians who primarily advocated for citizenship. Um, as a matter of fact, the society quickly embraced the idea of citizenship as a way to be granted more rights and have a voice in the dealings of the state. In its statement of purposes, it established that its goal was to, I quote, promote citizenship among Indians and to obtain the rights thereof. So members hope to be treated on an equal footing uh, with the rest of the population and to get rid of their status as wards of the federal government as, and I'm also going to quote Zitka Rasha, sorry, uh, she's like, yeah, this sort of trope. <laughs> but she wrote in, in um, 1921, um, I think in, it's in her essay, America's Indian Problem. Uh, she said that the wardship is no substitute for American citizenship. So in fact, the editorial comments of most of the quarterly journal of the Society of American Indians are filled with uh, calls for citizenship, um, highlighting the merits of indigenous people who had made every effort uh, and deserved to be treated as equals in US society. And at a time when deeply rooted discrimination shaped the structure of society, uh, and indigenous people were still seen as inferior, uh, these calls for equality were strong and bold political stances, um, I think. <laughs> it was a matter of survival for some who believed that only equal treatment and education could free indigenous people from constant neglect. Um, and in that sense, uh, SAI members called for a form of conformity to mainstream society, but at the same time highlighted the need to find a balance between two worlds, rather than abandoning one for the other, which was the alternative, apparently. So activists wrote time and time again about indigenous people finding their rightful place to be agents of their own adjustment. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in if if you have stuff about this idea of adjustment, I'll come back to it, but it's just, I see it everywhere. And anyway, so some went even further and stated that turning indigenous people into an average white man was not enough and that indigenous communities at large should strive for more than that. So for instance, Oneida activist Laura Cornelius Kellogg stated in uh, 1913, I quote, we want education, yes, we want to know all the educated Caucasian knows, but we want our self-respect while we are getting his knowledge. In short, let us discriminate between the goods and the bads of civilization and the goods and, the, and bads of his own heritage. Weed out as many of the bads as we can and send him along the way a finer type of citizen than if we turn him into a very average white man just to have him white in culture. <laughs> 
So actually, it was not only equal education that they sought, uh, but a sort of elevated form of education, uh, one that would enable them to retain parts of their knowledge and ways that were deemed truthful to make them into better citizens. So there was here no inherent superiority uh, to uh, white culture over indigenous cultures and ways, but an equal treatment of each culture. In that sense, this approach differed from that of white reformers at the same time, who did not take into consideration the contributions uh, that indigenous knowledges could make to American society. Here, there was no need to de-tribalize, uh, to be worthy of citizenship, but tribal elements could actually benefit society at large. Um, citizenship was not necessarily seen as being opposed to indigeneity. Uh, in her article entitled The Mutuality of Citizenship and Sovereignty, the SAI and the Battle to Inherit America, uh, Tsianina Lomawaima writes that SAI members were fighting for what she calls an inheritance. Uh, that is to say, a respected place in modern society that remained connected to their indigeneity and tribal affiliation. So to do so, many members of the SAI um, relied on a strategy of adjustment, not assimilation, as we said um, earlier. Indeed, their writings are filled with references to this idea of adjustment. Uh, Charles Eastman, for instance, uh, in his article, The Indian in School, predicted that indigenous people would soon adjust themselves, themselves to the requirements of the new age and contribute, I quote, to the modern development of the land of their ancestors. Likewise, Arthur C. Parker stated, I quote, the Indian no does not need to be whitewashed or whitemanized. He needs an opportunity to develop along his own lines of individuality so far as these are consistent with modern environment. And remember, we are not the bleached out, devitalized, enervated, de-Indianized Indian or the new Indian, but the same old Indian adjusted to modern environment. Sounds like a poem almost. <laughs> So it was not a question of abandoning indigenous ways and cultures altogether, but to find balance between two sometimes radically different worlds. And for some indigenous activists, citizenship was seen as a way to possibly reconcile the two by recognizing indigenous people as being on an equal footing uh, with the rest of the population rather than remaining wards under paternal authority uh, of the federal government. So citizenship could be seen as a form of emancipation, and ideally, education was there to prepare them for that. Uh, in that sense, many advocated for the inclusion of indigenous cultures and achievements into the curriculum. Uh, Angel de Cora, who taught Indian arts at Carlisle, believed that this inclusion of indigenous knowledge in school showed that indigenous people were, I quote, ready to adapt their Indian talents to the daily needs and uses of modern life and to leave their own artistic mark on what they produced. Likewise, Luther Standing Bear uh, called for a double education of indigenous youth by giving back, I quote, to Indian youth all, everything in their heritage that belongs to them and augment it with the best in the modern schools. So hence we can see here um, how the point of view of many indigenous uh, intellectuals differed from the ideas of white reformers. While the latter advocated for detribalization and complete assimilation to be worthy of citizenship, that is a citizenship in opposition to indigeneity, indigenous activists envisioned citizenship as a way to be treated as equals, uh, to actively participate in the affairs of the state, and to be able to find a balance between two worlds that would be complementary. Education was seen on one side as a detribalizing machine and on the other as a potential tool to create pathways between two worlds. And so this is one of the reasons why many activists advocated for the passage of the Indian Citizenship Act. Uh, but which way did education go after the passage of that act? So I'll conclude with that. Um, the ICA was quickly followed by a massive transfer of indigenous pupils into public schools. Uh, in 1930, out of the 90% of indigenous children being in school, half of them were already in public schools. Uh, and this number rapidly grew in the following decades. 
So as you can imagine, programs in such schools remain deeply entrenched in the general idea of the superiority of settler contributions to the fabric of um, the settler state. In my PhD dissertation, I analyzed the contents of history programs more specifically uh, to try and understand the images and ideas that were taught to indigenous pupils in those schools. And in the 1920s and, and 30s, America's children were taught that when European settlers arrived, I quote, the land was but thinly populated. Uh, which negated the existence of hundreds of complex societies on the continent. Examples such as this one abound in the literature and the official reports of the time, showing that the hopes of indigenous activists, you know, that indigenous contributions would be recognized and celebrated, were not given a place in schools across the nation yet. Uh, even more than that, the history textbooks that were used at the time usually depicted indigenous people as being counterexamples of courageous, industrious pioneers. Um, the idea of the incompatibility of indigeneity with the values of uh, US society, and thus what citizenship entailed, remained deeply entrenched in the schools and participated in the further colonization of indigenous pupils' minds. Besides, these racist depictions could, in some instances, fuel resentment among the white population, which further antagonized indigenous people. For instance, in R. W. Crochar's 1934 report, The Problem of Educating the Sioux Indians in South Dakota, he stated that white people in the state kept, I quote, a prejudice against the race and feared that indigenous pupils and their diseases would affect their children. So not only was the general population usually taught that its heroes had fought against indigenous nations, uh, but also that indigenous people lacked the qualities that made them good citizens. Despite the hopes of many indigenous activists, the incorporation of indigenous people as equal citizens into mainstream society led to a form of acceleration of assimilation of indigenous pupils in public schools. And their perspectives, histories, and contributions were not regarded as worthy of interest. However, I don't want to end on that really sad note, um, the indigenous voices that arose at the turn of the century did find some echo. In the Miriam report that we mentioned, one could read that Indian education needed a change of point of view. Uh, it recommended adapting programs and methods to the specificities of each indigenous nation, to recruit indigenous teachers and to protect the link between pupils and their community. But funding and political will lacked behind, and these recommendations were seldom implemented, um, at least not, you know, at the full scale. Uh, some off-reservation boarding schools were closed, as uh, Ned mentioned um, earlier, I think. Um, community day schools were built and attempts at implementing bilingual textbooks across the nation, su such as the Indian Life series, were put in place. Um, however, their impact was rather limited uh, for a time. Renewed call for change emerged later in the 60s and the 70s and continue to this day, but still face tremendous obstacles. Uh, initiatives such as the publication of cultur culturally relevant programs, the building of immersion schools, the charter schools movement are all part of, I think, the legacy of those initial attempts at theorizing this idea of adjustment and understanding which place indigenous people hold in the American citizenry and what role should be given to education. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank